Okay, our speaker, Mark Covino, uh, who is originally from Queens, New York. Mark Covino fell in love with film at an early age. Mark moved to Vermont to attend Burlington College, earning a BA in Cinema Studies and Film Production in 2006. While pursuing his undergraduate degree, Covino worked on productions such as Unless a Death Occurs, Casing Examine for PBS, Rally Nation, a pilot option for ESPN2, as well as the highly acclaimed Black Panther documentary, What We Want, What We Believe. In early 2009, fellow Vermont filmmaker Jeff Howlett approached Covino with an idea for a documentary about the Detroit African American proto punk band Death. Their subsequent feature length documentary, A Band Called Death, won the 24 Beats Per Second Award at the 2012. Thanks for waiting, guys. <laughs> um, does anyone have a question? <laughs> Am I supposed to just start? Or? <laughs> I feel like I'm naked in front of my classroom right now. It's funny. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, oh shit. Sorry, I'm fucking it up. Okay. Are we allowed to curse? No cursing? What? Cursing? All right. All right, fuck. All right, good. Okay. Yeah. Um, I was just curious, how did you find out about, find out about, yeah, yeah sure. <laughs> um, I found out from my co-director, Jeff Hallett, he had known the band for 20 years as Lamb's Bread, and um, they actually helped Jeff uh, get his start. They they created the thing called the Reggae Fest, and they created the thing called the Rock Fest in Vermont, and asked Jeff's band back in the early 90s to be part of that, or 80s, I think, even. I don't I can't even remember, but anyway, they met Jeff 20 years ago. And Jeff knew Bobby Jr., his son, because he played in a lot of punk bands, and Jeff was a hard rocker himself. And Bobby Jr. came up to him one Christmas and was like, hey, me and my brothers are getting together. We're going to be covering my dad's music at the Monkey House, which is this little club in Winooski, Vermont. You should come check us out. And Jeff was like, you guys are going to be playing reggae? All right. So he went to go see the show and was just blown away when he heard Death's music and talked to Bobby more about it. And then shortly after the New York Times article came out, and Jeff knew he had to make a film and he shot like a one hour interview with Bobby Jr., um, which was kind of rough. Jeff wasn't too experienced with documentary filmmaking at the time, so I had met him on a music video, and I had already spent six years of my life doing nothing but doc work, and he asked me to come on board, and we kind of became a team. <laughs> Did I do that okay? <laughs> Anybody else? Right. That's higher on the oh. <laughs> <laughs> Number one question. <laughs> Feel free to ask me anything, I'm an open book. Oh, yeah. Don't ask me that. <laughs> uh, what was the most challenging part of making it? It's two, two things are challenging. Uh, first is financial. Uh, this was a, uh, it was a labor of love. Jeff and me knew we had to start filming ASAP because somebody might, somebody else might start filming ASAP about these guys, and and we knew the band, or Jeff knew the band, and and Jeff knew my talents, and we knew that if we put everything in, like all of our money, all of our time, all of our equipment, <laughs> used all of our resources, all of our friends' help that we could make a really kick-ass film. We just knew that. And and so we both went really broke in that process. Um, um, the other challenging thing was somebody else did start making the film. Th three months, four months into us shooting, a really huge hip-hop star started doing his documentary on the band. and wasn't talking to us, and, and, you know, we tried to break the ice, but it didn't work out, but anyway, we made a really kick-ass trailer, and he went away eventually. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I don't want to mention his name, but uh, he most definitely was making a documentary <laughs> on him. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, money was the most challenging, and Jeff and me, after about a year and a half into filming, we're about to give up on the project. Not really give up, but, like, really draw it out, make it like a eight-year project like Hoop Dreams, which, you know, God, my whole life. But, uh, you know, Jeff calls me up from work at 9 a.m. He's like, dude, this sucks. Like, I'm going through a divorce. I'm losing my money. You're losing your money. You know, you're you're basically 
committing all of your free time to this film. It's killing us. Let's just let's not try to finish it so fast. And so it was a pretty depressing phone call. Two hours after that phone call, a friend of mine who's like a Twitter whore started texting me frantically. How come you didn't tell me Scott Moser is all about your movie and blah, blah, blah. So I called him back immediately and I was like, Scott Moser, producer of Good Will Hunting and Clerks, what? Like, he knows that I exist and that I made a movie? Uh, well, what happens is he saw the trailer that the same hip-hop artist saw and, and thought that the movie was done and wanted to see the movie and uh, started <laughs> tweeting about how, hey, I want to see this. This band is awesome. Fucking hey, this is great. Yeah. And so I, I wasn't sure what Twitter really did back then. I, I wasn't on Twitter. I wasn't re really on Twitter until I got my film into the first film festival. But um, I asked my friend, could you write him a personal message and give him my email address and tell him I would really like to talk to him? <laughs> and he did that. And within an hour, I got an email from Scott. And then that night, me and Jeff were on a conference call with him. He kind of became our producer the same night that we had that conversation. So, a little Cinderella story. Of course, money didn't come flying in right off the bat. I mean, that's not what Hollywood producers do. He was guiding us and helping us, and then he brought in two partners to help us find money. And in Hollywood, there's like no fucking money anymore, so they spent about three months looking for money. And me and Jeff were like, ah, "This is great. We have Hollywood producers, but we have no money. How are we going to finish this?" And and then one of our producers, Matt Pernicerio, was hanging out on the set of the show Entourage, this HBO TV show, and um, he was talking to his friend, who uh, Jerry Ferrara, who plays Turtle on that show and showed him my trailer and told him our predicament. And uh, at the end of my trailer, Jerry said, say no more. He whipped out a checkbook and wrote a check for $50,000, and we had finishing money. So. <laughs> yep. um, of all the other like undiscovered early punk bands, what made you want to do this story about death? Like, What about them like, attracted you? Well, for, for me, like. I'm less the music historian than Jeff is. Like for Jeff, it was big. Like he was like, "This is you know." I I don't even know what Jeff thought, but he knew it was big. Uh, me personally, I just heard really great fucking music. Um, as soon as I heard "Keep on Knocking," I uh, I knew instantly after reading the story in the New York Times and and hearing everything Jeff had to say about the band. Uh, when I heard that song for the first time, and and to me it was like, I'm the only one listening to this right now. No one else is listening to this, even though other people were listening to it. It wasn't a lot of people at the time. Um, I just knew. I just knew that this was probably one of the, you know, one of the greatest rock and roll stories not heard yet. Even though it was in the New York Times, I felt like it could be heard on a, a bigger scale, like all over the world, which luckily this movie's been able to do for it. Did I answer that all right? <laughs> um, I have two questions. Sure. Um, the first question is, there seems like there's a ton of photographs and notes, and I'm just sort I'm, I'm a little blown away, especially because the 70s, or people weren't taking a lot of pictures. So the first question is, where did all that stuff come from, and was it like one person in the family that was documenting everything from mm -hmm. like rehearsals in the one room in Detroit? Um, or was it just like you guys compiled it with everybody? And then the second question is, what now that this film is kind of blowing up, what is that doing for these guys now? And is that kind of furthering their music even more? Or, you know, how was what's what's going on with all that? Okay. Um, That's a yeah, the, I'm glad you asked about the photos because I was the only one scanning all of those photos, and there are <laughs> thousands of those photos. And I was starting to go see. I was like, my eyes are crossing, and I didn't know what I was doing half the time. But. Uh, they were mostly at Bobby's house in Vermont, and to my knowledge, uh, the family took a lot of photos, and especially David Hackney took a lot of photos. Um, he liked to be behind the camera. There weren't a lot of photos of him in front of the camera. Um, no films, obviously. They couldn't afford film. Uh, poor family in Detroit. You know, it's understandable. But photography, they, they, they definitely took a lot of photos, and... Uh, I, I scanned most of the photos from Bobby's house in Vermont, some from their Aunt Laverne's house in Cleveland, Ohio, and then some from uh, uh, Heidi Simpson uh, at David's house. I think there was maybe one photo I might have scanned from their mom's house, but there weren't a lot of photos over there. But uh, I spent hours just scanning photos and you know, 600 DPI so that the special effects guys could do all those cool zooming effects and uh, when you're scanning 600 DPI scans it goes really slow. Um, and yeah, I mean the, the film has been doing 
extremely well for the band. Um, they're actually just starting their tour. They're west to, <laughs> they say west to northwest tour, but it's like southwest to northwest tour. I mean, they're starting in low California and going all the way up to Seattle, um, doing a bunch of shows. And they've been, the movie's played now in Australia, Spain, uh, Germany, and all these people all over the world are just buzzing about the band. They want to see the band. And so it's been doing exactly what we intended it to. Um, like I said, it's a passion project. Jeff and I haven't seen a penny from this movie, but it's it was meant to basically just get the band's name out there, and it's doing exactly that, so it's making us all very happy. Yeah. Yes, and how long did you guys spend doing this project? Like It was, it was three years of filming and following them around and about a year of post-production, doing all the editing, uh, sound mixing. I don't, I don't know if you guys saw it. It was mixed at Skywalker Ranch. That's thanks to Scott Mosher. Um, <laughs> But uh, also the graphic photos, that took a lot of time to do, picking the right photos to use and then having those guys go in After Effects. There was a company in Florida called Stellar Hawk that did that, and they did the movie more than a game, which my producer also produced. Uh -huh. yeah. Actually, I'll, I'll ask one question. Yeah. So before the whole reunion, had they ever actually played a concert or they only played in the bedroom in the house? <laughs> they only played in the bedroom in the house or in backyard shows. Um, they played one show at a cabaret in Detroit, but everyone left. <laughs> so they never... And, and then one thing that's not mentioned in the film um, is uh, David had stage fright. So uh, even when they were the fourth movement, he would walk off stage halfway through a set. And so they, they just weren't good live, I guess, with, <laughs> with David because he was so afraid. But, uh, but yeah, <laughs> never, never really played a live show as death until, until the Joy Ramon show, which isn't shown in the movie, and then after that, the Detroit show. Yeah. It talks about how at first they were kind of, the guys were reluctant to do a live show. So were they kind of reluctant when it came to a documentary? Yeah. Uh, well, at first... I'm sorry if I'm fucking up the sound here. I'm just trying to fix this in my ear. Um, at first, they were uh, Bobby especially was a little reluctant because he thought he told Jeff he was like, "What is this going to be like a YouTube video or something?" Uh, <laughs> like he didn't really get the concept. And and even when we started filming, other documentaries are getting really popular, like this, uh, like Anvil, the story of Anvil. And uh, and Bobby's like, "You guys aren't going to be making us look like a couple of fools, are you?" <laughs> You're like, "No, man. We're just trying to tell your story." And, and so it took. It took a little bit of time, but for the most part, they're very open and willing to let us film everything. Um, the only thing that took uh, a, a little arm twisting was getting him to talk about David becoming an alcoholic and, and all of his dark years. That took a year and a half of, of gaining their trust and, and letting them know that, you know, this is an important part of the story that we need to tell. And then uh, once we got there, I mean, that, those were 12-hour interviews each for, for Bobby and Dennis where we just sat in a room and just ask them everything. Uh, those are the blue jumpsuit scenes that you see. They're, they're death jumpsuits that they walk around town wearing proudly every time. They, they stick out like sore thumbs in Burlington still to this day. <laughs> um, anybody else? No? Anything? All right, that's good. <laughs> Anyone have a follow-up? Oh, you do. No, I, I, this is more of a comment. I, I just think it's really beautiful what you've done. I think you did an excellent job, and I think they would be proud. I think they are proud of this, and I think it's just a great gift to the family and show their you. hard work to when, live on. I when I showed it to the family for the first time, it was at St. Michael's College, which, by the way, Dennis Hackney was recently laid off from. Um, so, you know, he's, he's struggling. But um, he was able, at the time when he was working there, to set up a screening in the screening room kind of like this. There's a little bit more seats. And uh, we invited their whole Vermont family and uh, my Vermont crew. It was a private screening uh, just to show them the first rough cut. And after the credits started rolling, I started shaking and like crying. And this has never happened to me. I don't cry at my own movie. <laughs> and, and I got up and I turned around and Bobby Hackney Sr. was standing right next to me. And he just grabbed me and like hugged me. And we both cried for about 20 minutes. <laughs> it was one of the most emotional things ever. Um, and he just like he's like he's like he, he did it. He did us justice, and, and I'm I'm proud of you, and I'm happy, and I'm, I really appreciate it. So, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Anybody else? Oh yeah. 
So a lot of the press on uh, Death is kind of focused on their place in history as maybe like a proto-punk band. But I noticed the uh, the documentary doesn't really contextualize them within punk. Do you have any thoughts about calling them that or what their legacy yeah. is musically? Uh, Jeff, Jeff, especially because he's a musician and, and a punk rock musician, and me, because I know the true story, they never considered themselves punk. They were just doing music that they wanted to do and... Like Bobby Sr. says, if you called anyone a punk back then, you'd get a bloody nose. Um, they had no knowledge of really punk music. and I mean, they kind of heard it as it was coming up. Uh, and Bobby Sr. really got his first, uh, I don't know, knowledge of it when he was a radio DJ for a college radio station in Vermont. And he started like playing Dead Kennedys and, and uh, Black Flag and stuff like that. And he would come home and tell Dennis, you know, hey, some of these bands out there sounding a little bit like some of the stuff we were doing back in the day. It's kind of cool. But, you know, he never thought anyone was ripping off because nobody ever heard them, you know. So, I mean, uh, the press and, the you know, especially the marketing team behind our movie, which we have nothing to do with, loves to throw out that they were first punk rock band, this and that, and that's great. Whatever gets people's attention. But me and Jeff, our intention was never to say that they were the first. It was only to say that they were doing something original and something different uh, in a, you know, part of town that wasn't doing that. Um, did I do that okay? <laughs> All right. All right, good. Um, so uh, I was just curious, did you reach out to, um, or try reaching out to any of the like studios HR in, oh, in England? Uh, oh, the studio. Oh, no. Oh. They're saying that they weren't picked up by anyone you know, in the UK. We never did try to reach out to the studios. We did try to reach out to Clive Davis, so, and, and he kept saying he didn't want to do an interview. So. <laughs> <laughs> We're like, all right, if you don't want to do an interview, that's, that's fine. Uh, we, d we did interview, uh, I thought you were going to talk about uh, Detroit proto-punk bands. Like, like, we did interview Wayne Kramer. You can see his deleted scene on YouTube. If you type in Wayne Kramer, a band called Death. I don't know why he's a deleted scene. It's just worked out that way in the editing room. Um, I think he should be in the movie, so is Jeff. Um, he was, for anyone that doesn't know, he's a guitar player in the MC5, which a lot of people will say is one of the first punk rock bands. Um, you know, we tried to interview HR from, uh, is that his name? From the yeah, Bad Brains. Bad Brains. And, uh, he loves the band, but he didn't want to be interviewed just because, you know, he didn't have anything to say. They never heard the band before and, until recently. And so you're like, all right, cool, man. That's, that's fine. Because, you know, everyone kept comparing them to Bad Brains because of the reggae thing. But, I mean, again, like, barely anybody heard these guys until 30 years later. So, I mean, nobody was really influenced by them, as far as I know. Um, if anything, Don Schwenk, you know, the guy that waited 35 years to bring their record to a record store, he ended up writing a song inspired by death in the early 1980s. So if anyone was inspired, it was that guy. Maybe that's why he waited 35 years. But uh, <laughs> Too much weed. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, you know, I don't know why we never tried reaching out to any of those I knew those foreign companies, but we definitely did try Clive. Like I said, it's just he didn't want to look bad. Probably he we weren't trying to make him look bad. We were just trying to tell the story. Right. Um, oh yeah. Um, I'm just curious about um, how Hen you know how Henry Rollins, and especially him, and Elijah Wood were interviewed. Did they know about the band before you contacted yeah. them? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm glad you brought this yeah. up because. There are diehard music fans, diehard punk fans that will tear my asshole apart. Be like, what the fuck is Frodo Baggins doing in my movie? Or, you know, <laughs> fucking Henry Rollins is overrated. He's in every documentary. Fuck that guy. <laughs> uh, fucking neck. So I'm like, you know, fuck you guys. The reason why these guys are all in our movie is because we knew that each one of them were fans. We had heard through Twitter or through interviews that they did that they had mentioned the band and how they loved this band. And so... We seek them out. Elijah Wood in particular. I know he's the weirdest guy to see in this movie. <laughs> but, <laughs> but Elijah Wood was dating a chick from Burlington, Vermont. And he is an uh, avid record collector. We knew that. Um, and he was one of the first people to find a copy of the Death 45 before a lot of other people. And so he was like spinning it as a DJ in Burlington. And, and so we are like, this is awesome. Let's, let's interview him. You know? let's, let's hear what he has to say. Um, and that was fun. He was one of the best interviews I did. He was very gracious with his time and, and has a lot of new music knowledge, more music knowledge than anyone I've ever met. Uh, he could go on for hours just talking about the history of music. Um, Henry Rollins, Scott Moser had to interview him because that was out in L.A. and that was at the point where we ran out of our budget. 
that we ended up getting from uh, the Entourage guy, Jerry. Um, so uh, I don't know how that went, but I saw the full interview, and it was a great interview. Uh, Henry, again, very knowledgeable of music history. Yes, he is in every single music documentary, <laughs> but I mean, it's Henry Rollins. I, you know, my, my original goal was let's get as many famous people that we know know about the band into our movie, whether they're musicians or not, because that'll help. You know, somebody that doesn't like punk rock music might like Frodo Baggins, you know, and he'll see our trailer and go, like, oh, hey, Frodo Baggins likes this band. I'm going to go see this. So, I mean, that was like my main... And also, I wanted to get as many Michigan musicians as possible that knew about the band. So I, I had a whole list of everyone else, you know, like Eminem was on that list. Like, it didn't matter if I liked them or not or if they were hip-hop or not. I just wanted to hear if they knew about the band, and if they did, would they be interviewed? And, and the ones we got are the ones we got who knew about the band. Oh, it's a nice ringtone. <laughs> Is that a duck? <laughs> uh, any, anything else? Oh, yeah. Um, uh, over the course of the filming, what was like the most uh, surprising discovery for you? Hmm. Yeah, for me, it was the fact that I knew Bobby Jr. for 10 years, and I didn't know that he was Bobby Jr. Hackney until we interviewed him. <laughs> like, the kid sat down in front of me. I was like, what the fuck? You're Bobby Hackney's son? Like, I've known you for 10 years, but I never knew his last name. He just hung out with the same punk friends that I had. And we'd go see horror movies and shit. <laughs> I, mean, like, I mean, that, that, oh, I know, I know. You got me. Okay. The other surprising thing was we went to go film at Grooseville Studios, which you see in the movie. They're walking around. They're like, hey, here's Grooseville. I know it doesn't come across in the movie at all because we didn't edit it that way, but we thought that place was abandoned. We were told it was abandoned. Don Davis even made it seem like it was abandoned. He was like, you don't want to go there. There's nothing there. It's all locked up and boarded. We go there, and they go around the back, and you saw them shake the hand of some guy that was Don Davis's nephew who was playing the piano when they showed up, which is ironic because the first time they showed up at Gruzo back in the 70s, somebody was playing the piano. And Don Davis's nephew was playing like Fats Domino on the piano, and they showed up, and they realized this place is still open and it's still functioning and he took them through a tour inside and that's how we got inside and you saw all that footage. The reason it's so dark is because I had my, my PL filter on the lens. Like I, It was so sudden. I didn't think we were going to get in. I thought we were just going to film the outside and there's stacks of master tapes to the ceiling still in there. Just rooms just with boxes of master tapes and I'm filming and I look at this desk in front of me and right in the middle of it is this dusty master tape in a box. It says... Um, Untitled George Clinton album, you know, it just <laughs> fucking blew my mind uh, that it was. And and his nephew told us he's like, yeah, we're still functioning, but we're not trying to let anybody know. Like a lot of hip hop artists have been buying, you know, tracks from us and using it in their music. And so, yeah, I couldn't get into United Sounds. I tried like hell to get in there. Every we went there four different times, and it's boarded up. And I almost got through to whoever owned the building, but he was in Florida at the time. And, I would have loved to go into the United Sounds and film where they recorded the music. That's a legendary place, and it's, it's a shame what's happened to it. It's falling apart. And nobody's taking care of it. It should be a museum. I mean, it's as cool as Motown, in my opinion, but a lot of great bands came out of there. Yeah, anybody else? Okay, I'd like to thank everybody. We can stick around afterwards. There's more food. We also have, if you uh, were interested in what you saw, we have a research guide. So, for example, if you want to read more about the history of rock in Michigan or more about uh, the Midwest, more about punk, more about bad brains who were not influenced by them but people are making comparisons, check this out. And I want to thank you. Oh, and wait, oh, right. Uh, yeah, you've got if flyers. If anyone is interested, please uh, <laughs> hand a couple of these out to friends. Rough Francis is playing in Boston soon, and uh, it'd be it'd be really great if you guys could get some people to come out. You know, we also have two posters, two full size posters for the movie to yeah, give yeah. away. We did not display them because we do not have the we didn't have a space big enough. Um, I don't know if we want to do a raffle or if there are two people who are interested who who say I've got a wall space, then I'm I'm willing to put this up. Okay, I'm going to go with, with these two ladies that were the first ones with their hands up. Okay, here you go. Plus, you know, you asked a lot of questions, so you earned it. <laughs> if everybody wants a little Rof Francis flyer, too, like a poster poster. <laughs> yeah, five bucks. Broke uh, filmmaker fund, five bucks. No. Anybody else? No? No? Yeah, sure. <laughs> I gotta get rid of these things, guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Oh, I think uh, the gentleman on the side. Oh yeah. 
but take them all. Yeah. Give them to Thanks, Dan. Yeah. So thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thanks for waiting, guys. <laughs> um, does anyone have a question? Okay. Our speaker, Mark Covino, uh, who is originally from Queens, New York. Mark Covino fell in love with film at an early age. Mark moved to Vermont to attend Burlington College, earning a BA in cinema studies and film production in 2006. While pursuing his undergraduate degree, Covino worked on productions such as Unless a Death Occurs, Casing Examine for PBS, Rally Nation, a pilot option for ESPN2, as well as the highly acclaimed Black Panther documentary. Now, for my co-director, Jeff Hallett, he had known the band for 20 years as Lamb's Bread, and um, they actually helped Jeff uh, get his start. They, they created the thing called the Reggae Fest, and they created the thing called the Rock Fest in Vermont, and asked Jeff's band back in the early 90s to be part of that. Or 80s, I think, even. I don't know. I can't even remember. But anyway, they met Jeff 20 years ago. And Jeff knew Bobby Jr., his son, because he played in a lot of punk bands, and Jeff was a hard rocker himself. And Bobby Jr. came up to him one Christmas and was like, hey. What we want, what we believe. In early 2009, fellow Vermont filmmaker Jeff Howlett approached Covino with an idea for a documentary about the Detroit African-American proto-punk band Death. The subsequent feature-length documentary, A Band Called Death, won the 24 Beats Per Second Award at the 2012 Am I supposed to just start her? <laughs> I feel like I'm naked in front of my classroom right now. It's funny. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh shit. Sorry, I'm fucking it up. Okay. Are we allowed to curse? No cursing? What? Cursing? All right. All right, fuck. All right, good. Okay. Yeah. Find out about... Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, I thought...